This is Deep Blue, where we get the true life stories of BYU athletes, coaches, and fans. Here's your host, Jerem Jordan. On today's show, I talk with perhaps the most versatile coach at BYU. Has anyone else worked three Sweet 16s and two Elite Eights as a referee? After a stellar career at BYU, he played a year of minor league baseball, then found his calling in coaching. Dominating at Dixie, now successful at BYU. He's the best-looking male coach at BYU, according to Spencer Linton's wife and my own. He is baseball coach Mike Littlewood. What's up, Mike? Hey, it's, it's <laughs> awesome. And all I can say is you must have the most intelligent wives in the entire world. Listen, uh, you're a good-looking dude, and I really respect that. Um, Thanks for coming on the show. I'm excited to hang out with you. I always enjoy our conversations uh, around baseball season and in and around and everything. And, and I don't think people realize that you are a really good basketball ref. You've you've had this kind of double life here. Yeah, you know, I I well, thanks for saying that I was I was good. That's about that's what I was told. I don't actually that's know what that. Half the people say it depends. <laughs> it depends on which arena you're in. But yeah, I worked Division One basketball for 16 years, which is crazy. I worked high school basketball for four or five and junior college for a couple of years and, and um, transitioned into Division One. The same year I moved down to Dixie to take the job at Dixie Junior College in 1996. And then, and then I worked Division One basketball and built a schedule until 2012. Um, and to be honest, at the end of my career, the last five years, the Pac-12 supervisor would hand me the entire schedule, probably shouldn't say this, and say, pick 35 games that you want to work. And that's what I did. And so it was like... It was a dream. It was a, just a dream just to go. And I didn't care where I worked. I just wanted to work in the same area, L.A. for four nights, you know, go up to Seattle and work a few games. You know, just it, it was awesome. It was an incredible experience to, to be able to do that. So you would pick games around the baseball schedule? How did you manage both? I've always wondered how, to, how you did it, it was tough. So, yeah, I would – I was – first of all – when I first got this the refing gig, I got that a little bit before I was offered the job at Dixie State, and I wondered how both of them were going to work because, you know, I was a high school coach at Alta High School before that, and I knew a lot of the referees coached high school baseball or taught in high school or did some things in high school, so I know that was doable. My first year I got, in 1996, I got seven games. It didn't really matter. But my last year, my last few years I was working – 60, 70, 75 games a year. We're talking basketball, basketball games. from October to March? Yeah, it, it, November 1st through whenever I was let go of, final, you know, or of the uh, NCAA regionals or however long deep I worked into it, I was working. And so I would, um, I would know my baseball schedule, and I would literally some days go – have early morning practice with baseball because I, I actually owned a baseball academy. So we had indoor tunnels at Dixie. They were really the only indoor tunnels because there was no indoor facility at Dixie just because of the weather. We would practice hitting at 6, 7 a.m. I would drive to Vegas, get on a flight, referee a game somewhere in the country, fly back, practice, and then you know usually leave the next day and go. So I would miss probably a practice a week. I would never miss games. I would work around the games um, and until the NCAA tournament. Then I was allowed to miss games, and so it was it was a juggling act, and it was really busy, and I was worn out. During the same time in two thousand and two thousand one, there was a two year period where I was actually coaching professional baseball in the Western Baseball League down there, the Zion Pioneers, and refing and doing the college thing, and and I, I almost killed myself doing that, and so. <laughs> But I'm I'm a guy who loves to work. I I I hate being idle. I hate sitting around. Um, we stopped practice last week because we we can't practice anymore until January third, and I'm already going crazy. So that's just me. that's I why you're here work. today. I love to work just so. to do something. Exactly. Your wife called me. She said it's the He's only driving me insane. Get him out of the house. <laughs> exactly. That's a wild schedule. Um, and you wouldn't miss games. So you would – would you fly back the same night, you were saying? There's some the games? Sometimes you could fly back the same night. Yeah, it, depend, it, it depends on where you were yeah. um, in the country. And if I – I would work in Las Vegas maybe three or four times a year, so that was kind of nice. Could I could drive, right after. drive there and drive back. You could get back from certain cities, and you learned how to manipulate flights and, you know, get, get places that you need to get. Um, there was never – there was never when I worked and, – and rarely is there now – during the season, during the regular season, a college basketball game on Fridays. 
So I would always get back on Friday morning, practice Friday, and then leave uh, for leave Saturday. And that was just part every, – everybody had to work on Saturday because there's so many games, so many basketball games. Every every team in the country plays on Saturday, and so they need every every official. Um, so it, it got busy. But at the end of my career, I was working Sundays, Mondays, Tuesdays, um, you know, and I would make sure that I would block out a couple, two or three days that I that I could be at practice. I had great assistants in Trent Pratt and, and Brent Herring, who are still my assistants right now, and they carried a, they carried a big load. I mean, they they did a really good job of just staying focused. My guys, the players, really understood what was going on. They they actually embraced it. They they loved me refing, you know, and they probably loved me being away from practice for a little bit too. <laughs> um, but it was just um, you know, and you look at financially, I was probably probably making four or five times more money refereeing basketball than I was coaching baseball. Um, but there's no insurance and no 401k and there's none of that other stuff going on with, with refereeing. But a lot of guys just, just referee basketball and that's all they do. I was going to say, is it a full-time gig or not? For some guys it is. I know uh, Dave Hall is one of the best in the country who was here uh, you know, recently at a bunch of BYU basketball games. Da, da, da. Did you ever think, maybe I should be a full-time ref? There, there was a time. Um, Actually, two different times. One time was when I went through the NBA training for three years and was, was actually offered a position working in the NBA um, by what? by Joe Borgia, and he was, the, he was kind of the head of the NBA officials. And part of my contract was the first couple of years you have to work D-League games as well as NBA games. And I had to make a decision. I, I can't even tell you what year that was. Um, but, you know, it wasn't that hard of a decision – to email him back and, and say, I love refereeing college basketball. I love um, coaching, and that's kind of what I—that's kind of what's in my blood right now. So I, I'm gonna refuse. To, you know, I'm just gonna have to say no to this. And he, I never—I'll never forget. He emailed me back and he said, "You're the first person that's ever told me no." Oh wow! He's like, "We're we're the people who tell people no. <laughs> you know, we're the ones that say you can't work in this league." But the training that I got. Um, in, in the NBA training was was just incredible. They they break things down, they break video down, and and I learned a lot about how to how to evaluate myself. Um, so that was great. And then the other time was probably in two thousand eight nine. In two thousand eight, I went down and worked the um, the dream team, the two thousand eight Olympic team um, at Valley High School. Kobe and I mean just look Google 2008 Olympic team and that's that's where I worked. Shashevsky was a coach. And oh, it's to me it's it was second incredible. best team ever. Yeah, I mean it was the best experience that I've ever had. I got to sit there and when they took breaks and I just hung out there with them for two or three days and and refereed basketball. Um, and it was just I I I gained a new appreciation for Kobe Bryant and his work ethic because I wasn't really a Kobe fan before that. Um, and just how those guys interacted, and and um, it was it was just an incredible experience. And then the year after that, I was thinking, and I was talking to my wife about it. If I just I was working 60, 70 games a year, making pretty good money, and then if but if I could double my games, there's 126 nights you can work in in college basketball. And I'm thinking if I could work 115, um, 120, which I was I was young at the time. There's a lot of older guys than me that, that were working that many nights. I could make a lot of money and work for four months out of the year and be good to go. Um, but again, I came back to I love baseball. I just love I, – I don't know what I would do without being able to coach baseball. And so I stuck with it, and lo and behold, four years later, um, I, I get an opportunity to come here to BYU and coach. And so that's when – I mean, there's just not enough time to coach baseball at BYU and referee basketball. And so what, what's interesting is the year that I got this job in 2012-13, I was invited to the Maui Classic for the second year by by Hank Nichols, who was then – I actually think he still um, assigns those referees. The Maui Classic is the premier it's, multi-team it's event the, in college basketball. Yeah, it would have been the second – I worked it once. I would It would have been my second time. And I called Hank and I said, hey, I'm, I'm not going to referee anymore. I'm going to retire. I'm going to – take this baseball job at BYU and he said just come and ref this tournament it's not a big deal just come and ref this and I just <laughs> I thought about it for about five seconds and I'm like I, I can't do that and it would have been okay I mean I could have done it and that so that's when I, I packed it in and and um, you know and I've never really looked back I people ask me all the time do you miss refereeing and 
and I do when I'm like last night we played. Uh, we I, I know all the referees that come in. I, I go down at halftime if they're my good friends and talk to them. And I miss the camaraderie. It's just such a different feeling being on the court with two other guys, and everybody hates you in the in the arena. <laughs> I mean, not one person likes you. Um, they, but but for some reason there's there's just this. You you just sh- it's almost like clear the mechanism in for love of the game. It's it truly is what it is, where you just block out everything and you try to do the best job you possibly can on every single play, and you don't get them all right, and the crowd yells, but you're 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 a unit. You're a three person unit that night, and that that bond just never goes away. And some of my best friends are are basketball referees t- to this day. So is there something you know addicting or amazing about that? Sort of okay. It's us versus the world here, <laughs> because being a ref is so interesting. No, yeah, half the people are gonna hate. Well, everyone's gonna hate you at th- some point. Yeah, I think the number one thing you want to do. College is a coach's league. They told us this in the NBA. When you're working the NBA, it's a player's league. You keep the players yes. happy. Coaches don't matter. You know, to some degree. Yeah. You, you know, you listen, whatever, but. NBA has a union. You can do what you want, basically. But but if the co- if a coach doesn't like you at the college level, you're probably not going to work that. So you kind of have to keep the coaches happy. Um, but but we just wanted to truly, I think 99.9% of the guys out there, they just want to go out there and do their best. Um, and what differenti- differentiates an average to good to a great referee, I think, are, number one, the plays that you can kind of let go and, and keep the flow of the game. But most importantly is how you manage a game and how you communicate. Th- those are two of the, the biggest things. And I felt like I was pretty good at communicating, and I was a pretty good play caller. So as a group, if you can if you can communicate together from night to night, I mean, you're flying with these guys. We f- Flying from a place to a hotel, and you don't work with the same crew all the time, but there's a group of 50, 60 guys that, you're, that you get to know pretty well. You're with them a lot, you know, so it's a brotherhood. It truly is a brotherhood. So, yeah, it's a little bit of us against you. Um, but the best feeling in the world is when you know that you made the right call and everybody's booing you, like <laughs> University of Arizona. You can make the, the greatest call in the entire world. If it's against Arizona, you're going to get booed out of the gym, and you can just sit there and smile. The worst, the worst feeling is when you know you screwed one up, <laughs> <laughs> and you just have to sit there and wear it. That's bad, too, because I've been there as well. It's so interesting to me, and I promise we'll talk baseball, but I'm very intrigued by uh, this. We're talking to Mike Little with the BYU baseball coach, former referee. Now, people don't know, you have to be awesome to get to work the NCAA tournament. It's not just random, right? So what was it like to get to the point where you're doing, what, three Sweet 16s and two Elite Eights? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It, well, that's pretty cool. It, it's awesome, yeah, and I think that's what everybody aspires to. When, No matter who you ask in what industry in, the, in America wh- – they want to be the best at what they do, and and if you if someone says no, I'm happy just being this, they're probably lying to you, you know, um, or they're just an average Joe. And and um, I you know I, I think in athletics we're just not built like that, and so it can get a lot of guys carry it too far, and the, and that's all they want to do is make the make the postseason. They want to make their first. I mean, I that was my goal, but you can't step over people to get there, and and. Um, but that's the goal. I mean, you go out and ref, and it's like, are you a tournament referee or are you not? And then are you a regional guy? Are you a, an Elite Eight guy? Have you worked the Final Four? I like mean, that's, defined by this, that's right? how you're defined mm. in the refereeing circles. And so um, that's how you gain your credibility, and, and that's actually how you make more money. Because I won't get too much into this because I don't think it's right. But I mean, I don't think it's right for me to talk about it. But um, refereeing bas- college basketball is tiered. There could be three guys on the court, and one's making a lot more money than 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 the other ones, and it's just it's all merit based, and it's all there's a lot of um, seniority that that's involved with that. But who's determining the the merit? Um, the committee. There's, there's a, committee. a basketball yeah. refereeing committee. It, it, yeah, and and so you have to meet certain criteria. Like you, there's seven criteria. You have to meet five of them. Have you worked the NSA tournament? Have you worked deep into the tournament? Do you work this many games in this league? Um, there's, so there's a number of different things. Mm. But every single night, so right now I'm actually grading games. I grade referees for the, for the Western Consortium. So I get a schedule, I get it downloaded, and I grade referees. Um, and so – Like you watch the game? I watch the game and I grade the referees. So you're still involved in this way? I am, With yeah. refereeing. That's yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and, it's, and it's awesome. And 
So, like, when you're grading a game, there's you think, oh, he got the call right or wrong. But there's more than that. We have CCs, which is are calls correct, calls incorrect, CIs, no calls correct, no calls incorrect. Mm. And then you have a, a gamut of other things that you have to grade in this game. And so my point is, like, to get to the NCAA tournament, you're, you have someone at the game grading you. You have someone like me grading you on video. Um, your supervisor's grading you. So you're getting graded by three or four people, and you have to you have to watch video. You have to download it, and they are scrutinized more than anyone. And so, when you're there's a guy that sits by me in in the games at BYU, and he just rails on the referees. And I know like that a, a fan who doesn't fan, know what you're fan, doing, right? You know, I told my wife, I'm like, he would make a terrible referee, or you know, so, <laughs> most would, yeah. But but it's uh they there's no more scru- there's so much scrutiny on them that they can't make a move without knowing if if they're right or wrong and mm. so it's to get to the tournament is special and then you gain national credibility and um, I'll I'll never forget my very first game in the tournament but I'll never forget my sweet, first Sweet Sixteen um, it was with J D Collins who's now the the national coordinator and it was in St Louis. Um, at the Edward Jones Dome where they play football. And I, I walked in there, and there's like 38,000 people, and they they cut the court off at, at the 50-yard line. And so the end zone is all people. They put stands in. It was on CBS, and I remember the lights going on, and I'm like, man, it feels really hot in here. And then you're like, I don't even – I don't know if I can blow my whistle. <laughs> and it was uh, Florida, Butler, and – the ball was thrown up, and Joaquin Noah comes down and throws kind of a little elbow in, into uh, the throat of a guy. I blew my whistle. It worked. It was an offensive foul. Went the other way, and it was. And then it was just basketball. And so I got past that first game, and then it's just like anything else. Like you, once you do it, you move to the next level, and it everything's more comfortable to you. And, and those are great lessons to learn in life. Is like once you get past that level and feel that uncomfortableness. Um, like learn to be uncomfortable and thrive in it and then move to the next level and do the same thing. So I tell my athletes, my baseball guys about that all the time is like embrace embrace being uncomfortable and, and succeeding at that level because then you're going to go to the next level and you're going to be fine. And, that, and what you just did, what you thought was really hard, becomes kind of easy. We're talking with Mike Littlewood, the BYU baseball coach. Okay, I, again, I promise we're going to talk baseball, but there's <laughs> so good. many questions. It's all good. Okay, so you talked about Joe Kim Noah. Um, what are some of the memorable games you officiated in, memorable people or players that were in or moments that really stick out where maybe it got a little uncomfortable and you had to throw someone out or there was a call that you were like, shoot, I nailed – or I got – I missed that one, but I nailed this one? Well, there was um, – you know, I won't name names, but I was working Air Force. There, there's a lot of a lot of things that come to come to my my mind. I don't know if anybody remembers Don Haskins at UTEP. Oh, yeah. I was Glory Road. It was one of my very first. It was at UTEP, and it was one of my very first like games. And I make a call late in the game against UTEP for a push off, close game, and that I'm have to I have to go by his bench to report. And he's this like huge guy. I mean, and he's and he's scary. He's a scary guy. I mean, he's just a <laughs> just a legend. Yeah. And so I walk past him, and he's and he's saying you. Which I cannot say on this Bleepity podcast. Bleeper, you yeah. blankety blank blank blank, and I think, oh my gosh, he's <laughs> like he's coming at me, and I walk by him to report to the table, and it ends up that he's actually yelling at his player that I called the foul on for, and I'm like, got got past that one. <laughs> that that always sticks out in my mind because um, he could have just ripped me a new one. I was so young, he could have intimidated me. So I've always respected him for for not doing that. Any official that he really liked, he had a trailer out behind the arena. That they would, he would. And this is old. This is in the old days. This doesn't happen anymore. But he would invite them out out for a drink after. I never got invited to do, to do that. To um, drink some. I was obviously milk. known as a guy who didn't didn't do that. But um, those were the stories that were told. Um, <laughs> way, way, way to try and butter them up. <laughs> exactly. I was at Air, I was working a game, um, Colorado Air Force at Colorado State, and the coach said something to me. I teed him. Um, he said he said that I had to write a report because it was his second technical. He got thrown out of the game. He said that he didn't say it. I said that he did say it. I had to write a letter, and it came down to this big big deal. And the 
there's, I don't know, there's an officer that sits with them behind Air Force. And he stepped in and said, the referee was correct. Um, this is what he said. And the, the, the coach ended up losing his job over it. Mm. And so that was, you know, the, 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 there's always some of those things and there's always those coaches. There's a coach that I won't name that every single time I saw him on the court, he would try to intimidate and stare down and do these things. And finally, I'm like, I'm just going to stare you back down. And, you know, like, so when I, anytime he would stick his head out of, out of his, his huddle and, and stare at me, I just stare at him back and go, what do you want? Like, <laughs> coach your team. What do you want? What do you want from me? And Larry Skiskoviak, I gave him a tee. My last tee was Mike Montgomery um, at, at Cal. Uh, was he at Cal or anyway? Or Stanford. Or... He was at Stanford or Cal. Yeah. I think he was at Cal at the time. It was at Colorado, and he's shaking his head at me from across the court. And I'm like, no, that's not – you're not going to do that. <laughs> like, just – I mean, I remember those little things, but um, I would say what I remember most is – I mean, I – shoot James Harden and I like you you can just I watched um Steph Curry play um I was I was the alternate on on the game but I watched him play in the the elite elite eight when I had him in the bracket going to the elite eight that <laughs> year I'm very proud you, of that one David it was said. at the Ford Center yeah, um, yeah. Where, where there was like 60,000 people and I wasn't ref in the game but I was I was the standby just on the Telling them, keeping the clock and keeping fouls and different that's things. That's a good gig, right? Uh, yeah, that's no, no pressure. Actually, over, yeah. you'd rather be on the court if okay. you're a referee. But um, <laughs> the Olymp, the working the Olympic team was was an incredible experience. I, I mm. snuck my son Marcus in there, and he took some pictures with a with a grainy flip up camera. And I've I've got one picture that that actually we bought from Getty Images with Jason Kidd, and but it was a great experience. So many great experiences from from refing, and and I'm glad I did that. That's amazing, man. Um, all those experiences being in the game because everyone that loves sports wants to participate in some way. For me, the closest thing I can do is broadcast. You know, for you, it was refereeing, refing, but in baseball, it's coaching, right? For most fans, it's hey, I want to be at the game. You know, yeah. all of us want to participate that love sports in some way, but refing, there's like a you're right there, well, but you're not in the game, but you're like totally part of the game. Yeah, I think for me, I don't know, as an athlete or I, and I don't, I can't say this for anybody else who has a, a different job because I don't, I've never had one. But there's something that happens inside your stomach that almost makes you a little bit queasy and sick and ill right before you go out and do it. And refereeing did that for me. And now it's baseball <laughs> does that for me. So that's why I always carry Pepto Bismol wherever I go. It's like because. <laughs> They're they're not butterflies. They're more than butterflies. You know, it's it's just something inside you. that's like I got to do this, and I've got to go out and do this the best I possibly can. Because if I don't, then I'm going to be on ESPN. And I, I could tell you a story about that too in, in just one second where I was, and it, and it ended up not being really good. But that refereeing gave me that feeling, and now coaching here at BYU gives me that same feeling. And I would like I would never I would never stop coaching. Um, I can't see myself ever retiring. Um, and I actually like staying in, staying in the game, doing what I'm doing, grading referees right now. So, but the story was, um, I was working, it was New Year's Eve, um, and it was in Pullman, Washington, um, Oregon at Washington State. Washington State had never beaten Oregon. Well, this night, they should have beaten Oregon. Um, and, and I want to get the story right. So I think Washington State scored with Point three seconds left. Is this Clay Thompson, Washington State? Yeah, nice. He, he was. He was. I don't know if he was on the court that night. I, I don't know if he was playing that particular year. But I did work Clay at at Washington State. Um, but they, so they go up two. They score with point three seconds. Well, in basketball, with point three seconds, the only thing you can do on a throw in is tap the ball. So basically, Oregon would have to throw it all the way down to the end of the court, tap it in to to even tie the game. Well, when Washington State scores with .03 seconds on the clock, they everybody rushes the court. There's players like doing the horse horse ride with the you know with the towel doing this, and so one of the people on my crew called a technical foul, which was legit. I mean, it was a legitimate technical foul. In hindsight, we probably just should have let the clock run out. Game over. Long story short, Washington makes or Oregon comes back makes two free throws. It goes into overtime and Oregon ends up beating Washington State. We got chased out. We got chased out of Pullman. Police escort. I mean, it was it was not good. I had to meet with the press after and explain why we made the call. 
and it was not good. And now at the end of the rule book, there's a little there's a little thing that says that covers that particular play. Where, if there's a court storm, where if if there's a if there's a court storm at that point, you just clear the court and then and then start the game, L- let it r- let it run out. So I felt I felt really bad about uh, about that. It was on ESPN and. So my Pac-12 supervisor was like, hey, you had to call that or I would have had to suspend you. And I called other referees, and they're like, yeah, I should have just let it go. And so there was like this 50-50 mm. split. Um, it hurt me in the tournament. I only worked one tournament game that year where I, where I had worked the Sweet 16 or Elite, Elite 8 the year before, so I know that hurt. Um, and so that was, one of the, that was one of the down moments. But like you, if you're putting yourself in the highest level of what you're going to do um, – and being on ESPN in the Pac-12 or any P5 conference, that's the highest level that, that you're going to achieve working basketball games. And so the, the good comes with the bad. And um, the worst thing you want to do is be on ESPN. Although ESPN kind of like they took the side of the way, hey, they rushed the court, six men on the six men on the court. They delayed the game. They didn't allow Oregon to get the ball in. And those were all the reasons that we didn't, you know. Um, and so it's legit. And – but there, but it was split, you know, and it, and it kind of affected me for for a few years after that, that just that one call. And so hmm. it's not all rosy and fun because it's a high pressure thing. But uh, it's just like anything else you do at a high level. Just what I believe, what I do right now, um, what you do right now, being on TV, you know, uh, if you screw up, everybody's going to see it, you yep. know. Yep. Um, and so you want to be your best, but it doesn't always work out that way. And you just have to kind of. Like you had to pull up your 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 boots and and go to work again the next day. Now, for those who don't know, there's not like refs assigned to a specific league. It's like a group of leagues, correct? So there's no, no is, like yeah. just yeah. WCC refs. Which there's a fake account on Twitter at WCC officials. This account and I have this cantankerous relationship, which is really <laughs> fun. Um, but that doesn't exist. It's a group that covers multiple leagues, and they come in. So when people get mad at the refs. They're not the WCC refs right. for BYU, right? right? Yeah. In fact, um, when I was working, you basically worked for. There was a supervisor for every single different conference, so I worked for the PAC for three years. I worked for the Big Twelve, and I had to quit that because the travel was just so it was so tough. But it was an incredible league to work. Um, well, get used to the Big Twelve travel again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'm so happy for that. <laughs> yeah, so happy to go back in that. But. Um, and and then I didn't work the big sky. I, and and again, everything's everything is based on money with that. So what what's great now about the Western Consortium, Bobby Dibler, who's the guy who brought me into into refereeing in, in 2012, he runs the consortium. So he he's in charge of all these referees that work. The um, the Big West may or may not have their own. Uh, I'm not positive, but the West Coast Conference, the the WAC, the Mount West, and and the PAC are all run by Bobby. Um, and so it, it, it is. You could get, in fact, a lot of those guys will actually go out and they'll work the Big 12. So you may be getting a guy who worked the Big 12 or the Big East or the Big 10 last night. And in fact, I know one of the referees who was on the game last night works the Big 10 and works in another league. Um, and, he, and he worked our league last night. And so it kind of cracks me up and goes, "Hey, West Coast, the eh, horrible run, you know, whatever." Mm-hmm. When they don't, they don't really know. Basketball is kind of a tough. It, it's a tough game to call, but it's a fun game to call. But uh, right now, I think it's really good how how it's set up, where you just go work different places at different times on 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 the West Coast. Is it the toughest game to officiate? Well, it's interesting because I I actually refereed college or college junior college football. I, I what ref- haven't you done, Mike? I refereed, I offic- I umpired Division One baseball. I I umpired Utah BYU baseball games when it was in the WAC. So I I did the WAC. I when umpired you were in the WAC. Coaching in high school? Before that, just right when I got done playing, um, there was probably a two or three year period. So I've I've done that. I, I did football. Um, I, I loved football. Football is the easiest. Um, I would say basketball, basketball by by far is the is the most difficult out of the three that I've mm. uh, ever refereed. Why do you feel football is the easiest? I just think like if you, everything's black and white in football. Um, you have you have seven, eight, nine. I don't even know how many guys that have it out there anymore. But you have a specific area, and if the play's going away from you, and there's a little bit of a hold over here, you can choose not to call it, you know, which is you can do the same thing in, in basketball. And so what I found in football is if it really had an impact on the play, 
then you throw your flag. If it's like a hold that's five yards behind the play, then then why even pull your flag out? And so uh, pass interference calls were really tough. Those, those kind of calls were, were kind of tough. But really everything else is, oh, this guy went off sides, throw a flag. The ball's, you know, you where the ball end to, to spot it? That's not super difficult. Um, is, is a, did a lineman go too far down line? So there's, there's, you're, you're assigned specific things in, in football. Where in basketball, if the play happens clear over there and my two partners miss it, but it's an elbow, I, I better get that because that's a game-changing call. And so somebody's got to get that. Hmm. And I'll never forget Dave Hall my first year. He, Dave, Dave and I get, get along really well. He was a left-handed pitcher at University of, of Colorado. There's a lot of baseball guys that referee basketball. And Dave said, hey, before we went out on this game, he's like, hey, just concentrate on your 10%. I'm like, 10, 10%? You mean 33? Yeah. I mean, like, I've got, at least got 30% of it. And he goes, 10%. He goes, I got the rest. He goes, and if you don't call your 10%, then I'm going to call your 10% for you. And what he was trying to tell me is, like, I've, I've got this covered. Nothing is going to go wrong on this. And if you watch Dave Hall ref, um, he's a great game manager, and he knows when to make calls. And does he miss some? Of course, everybody does. But I've learned from some of the best. I learned from some of the best guys who were just not the mechanical, which you'll see in the NBA a lot right now, and those guys are great. They're great referees. But it's good bodies, good mechanics, and really the plays are like secondary. Where in college basketball, it's game management. Try to get the plays right, keep keep the coaches happy. So there's a lot of philosophical things that go into it. How do you think the umpires perceive you knowing, maybe they don't know, that you have umpired? Does that affect the relationship a baseball manager or coach has with an ump? I know. I bet you they don't know that I – umpired baseball but do you ever let them know no in the heat of the moment no never <laughs> but but I but they do know I referee basketball Mo- most gotcha. every guy knows that I referee basketball and at Dixie it was kind of weird at Dixie it was like it was there was almost a jealousy because mm. if because you can, junior college maybe because junior college and maybe because like in bas- ba- refereeing college basketball is kind of the ultimate as far as pay you can make oh. a lot of money um, more than with, football yeah because you can work Multiple games oh, a yeah, day, yeah, yeah, true, yeah, you can, true. A, a week. You it's know, a football, volume. You're thing. One, football, you're getting one game a week. It's a volume thing. Um, overall, the best job would be an NFL referee. That's that's a great job. Um, the, uh, pays Vin, really well. Vinovich, Bill Vinovich, Bill Vinovich, one of my good friends. Did does the NFL? He got a lot of scrutiny for the uh, yep. no call with the Saints a couple right. years ago, and then the next week he comes to does a BYU St. Mary's game, yeah. and the Rock. BYU student sector really gave it to him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Bill Vinovich was was one of my great friends from LA, and he actually had a, a little heart issue where he had to stop refereeing basketball for a little bit, and, a, and actually had to stop refereeing in the NFL. But grades out every single year as the best NFL referee, and that's really? why you, that's why you see him working the the Super Bowl and division titles no every idea. single year. But super super nice guy. Um, Mike, interesting kind of side stories. Mike Pereira, mm-hmm. who now does like. Hey, this was a Fox <laughs> Studio been, yeah. ref guy. Well, yeah. when I was working junior college basketball and junior college football, he invited he was he was the the whack supervisor of football referees. And he had invited me to go up to Utah to work spring football to the so the next year I would be hired into the whack. And I'm like, "Yeah, that sounds awesome." Well, it all this stuff happened right in 2012. And so I get this job, couldn't go to Utah. I get the job at BYU. I couldn't go up to Utah to work spring practice, obviously. Um, well, two years later, he Mike Pereira becomes the supervisor of NFL referees. And so it's just interesting the paths. Because I think if I, if I could have chosen, I would have chosen to be an NFL referee. Um, that's what I would have probably – because you, you can – back in the day, it was like they played on Sundays. Um, maybe sometime now it's like they play every, every Thursday, they could Sunday, play Monday. Yeah. yeah, but back then you could go to school Monday through Friday. You have to be in into the game the morning before the game in in the NFL. Same thing with with the NBA, and that was one of the de- determining factors of why I chose not to do the NBA. Um, twenty four games a, a month. Um, twelve twenty four games a month. Eight, eight at the time it was between the D League and that it was like oh, 18, wow. 18 to twenty four games a month. Be there the night before, unless unless you have a, a game back to back, which you're going to. 
Um, so so there was a lot of but NFL like you work Monday through Friday, leave Saturday morning, do all of your training for that particular game, watch watch your film, and then work the game on Sunday and come home Sunday night and go back to work on Monday. It was it's a great a great gig. A lot of bankers work um, in the NFL. Interesting. And the NFL officials are the most known officials. It feels like because they talk on the mic. Yeah. Like it's a different deal. Obviously, Major League Baseball umpires, you kind of know their names, and they, nowadays we like, you know, we talk about their names and who they are and show their faces. But the NFL, the guns are showing off. I think you really would have <laughs> done well there, right? Yeah, I was um, skinny back then. Ed Hockley, and I think his brother, right, or Ed, something. Ed Hockley, yeah, yeah, he was the man. Does he have a brother yeah. that refs too, or something? I don't know if he does. Yeah, or not. yeah but no. he's got the guns and yeah. the whole thing. That's fascinating. Yeah, that's interesting. College basketball is the king of there. College basketball. I mean, there's just wow. there's just nothing like college basketball, especially when you get into March Madness. It's just you see all these people. I had a chance to work Duke a couple times, and I, I had a chance to work at Kentucky in 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 a Sweet Sixteen, and I mean, just all these places that that um, you know. And then you talk about the travel and the travel stories that you're trying to make flights and you know do different things. And I took a private plane to. Um, it, the funny story. I mean, this, I almost died. That's what I like to say. So I, I get a late call from, and I'm working the Big Sky. I worked Big Sky one year. I get a call from the supervisor, who said, "Can you go to to Northern Arizona and work a game?" I guess she felt like St. George and Northern Arizona and were like Flagstaff? right next to each other. They're in Flagstaff. not. But there's like a little canyon you have to go <laughs> through. Yeah, yes, yes. The, the Grand Canyon. And so anyway, I'm like, oh god, I can't turn this game down. It's at seven o'clock. We play baseball that day at uh, 1. Maybe I can move that game to 11, and I can find a way to get down there. So long story short, <laughs> I rent a plane. I rent you a rented four, a plane? I rent a four-seater. It cost me like $750. Yeah. And I, I invited my – so we had the pilot, and I invited my um, a- athletic director and the president of the school, who was a great baseball guy who hired me. And so we all jumped in the plane right after the game, 3.30, got down there at 4.30, went to – like Golden Corral or something, <laughs> some like really nice restaurant down there. <laughs> and so had soup and salad, did our thing, went over to the game, ref the game. And the, the the bench is like, hey, there's a storm coming in. So be careful driving home. I'm like driving. We I rented a plane. We, we're we going to fly home. Like you better get out of here really quick because this storm is, is coming in. Mm. So we go to the airport and we go to where the plane's parked. And we can't find the plane. Oh, my gosh. And the storm's coming in, and it's like the winds are blowing like 40, 50 miles an hour. And it's crazy. I'm like, so we're sitting in the, in the terminal where nobody's in. It's a little teeny private thing. And finally, the guy goes, hey, I found the plane. The pilot's like, I found the plane. They took it way out here and parked it way out here. So we get in the plane. We take off. We're going over San Francisco Peak. And we hit the storm. And we are literally flying sideways. The wind is pushing us sideways. So... This is what it felt like. My head is slamming against the, the 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 window. I'm in the front, and the pilot. I look over the pilot, and he goes, "Hey, we're okay." So uh, I look at the pilot, and, and he's kind of a training pilot, and I'm and I'm if he's okay, then I'm okay. So, training pilot meaning he was in training. N- no, he was a he he trained a trainer. Other so, yeah. Okay. So I felt like we're in good hands. <laughs> Big difference. And so he's yeah. So he's comfortable, and he's just like going okay. And it's finally like it's bumpy, 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 and he's like, "Hey, we have to, we have to be able to see the road because this plane doesn't have navigation. So I have to follow the headlights from like Canab to all oh, the way wow. through." And I'm like, "Well, I, I wish I would have known that before, but <laughs> anyway, we're up here, so let's just try to get home." And so all of a sudden, we're probably a half hour into this flight. This is going to take us an hour and twenty to get home, and it's a whiteout. It's like it. All you can see is these like four inch flakes coming at and that's all you can see like when you're driving and it's a blizzard that's what it was like but we're we're like 30,000 feet in the sky and all of a sudden I look over at the pilot and he is going like he is scared oh no he is he it's like you can make sawdust out of the, out of the steering wheel <laughs> and I look back at I look back at the president and and uh, my athletic director and their backs are on the seats of the chair and they're just scared to death. They're looking up at the ceiling like they're, and so then I get scared, oh, and I'm no. like, I am like, what are, what are we gonna do? And he goes, we can't. He goes, we can't get home. And I go, we gotta turn. We turn around. What do we do? And he goes, the storm's behind us. Well, I don't know. He goes, let me just try to figure this thing out. That's what the pilot's saying. So all of a sudden, we're. we're I, he goes, we're kind of over Canab. I think there's a dirt 
I think there's a dirt like landing strip somewhere down there. I think. So he, so we do a nosedive. We start going to, and I, it's the first time in my life. I'm like, I knew I shouldn't have got on a little plane because I, I have, I've always had a premonition. I'm going to die on a plane. This is it. I'm dead. Do you still have that premonition? I do. Yeah. Mm. I just don't tell my team because they probably wouldn't fly with me. (laughs) And so we do a nosedive and we land on this, we end up landing on this dirt strip and we take, we, it's two 30 in the morning. And I, I feel responsible for these guys. Obviously, I am. You're the one that the plane's not going to take off. So we're stuck in. I think it's Kanab or somewhere close to Kanab. And so, I call this place. I, I I can't even remember the name of it. Like the Purple Lizard Shuttle or something like that. Well, that shuttle comes and picks us up and takes us back to St. George, and we get to St. George about six thirty in the morning. So, that was my one private private plane <laughs> refereeing story that I almost died. I almost lost my life, and it's the last time I rented a, a private plane. And I think I lost. I might have made a hundred dollars on that on that game <laughs> when everything was said and done. So, it was totally worth it. So anyway, but I did not turn the game down, and that was what was important. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's unbelievable. Okay, I'll ask you refereeing stuff off the air more because I have more. But okay, where did you grow up? What was your family dynamic like, and how did that shape you? Yeah, you. Um, so I never knew my my birth father. He. It was one of those stories, and I haven't I haven't really talked to my mom. A, a whole lot about it because honestly I haven't cared um, a whole lot because I got lucky and was adopted at two uh, by the by the father that I know but uh, my my birth father it was one of those hey I'm going out to buy cigarettes and um, I'll be back in a while and he never never came back played hide and go seek and he's still just gone. gone yeah wow and so I was born in Watts uh, my mom says I was the only in 66 and so we know what was going on in 66 in Watts and my mom said I was the only white baby in the entire in in the entire hospital, and you and were so born in Watts. I was born in Watts. Wow, this is L.A. This is L.A. Yeah, and so lived there just briefly. But when I was two, I was adopted by my dad. So my my natural father, my birth father, was was Basque um, from Portugal, Spain, and um, then their family moved to Colorado, New Mexico, and kind of migrated. My daughter. Just because um, I had I had some I had a tumor like 15 years ago, a gastrointestinal stromal tumor, and it would it I was sick for like two and a half years before that. Didn't really even know what was wrong, but they put me on on iron therapy. So I'd go in with all the chemo patients and have iron injections just to give me like I I could not my red blood cells were low and I couldn't like I just I was tired all the time. Something was wrong. Turns out, just from my physician, um, says, "Have you ever had a CT scan?" No, but I've had, I've had like tubes poked in every orifice of my entire body, and they haven't found anything. He says, "Well, let's do a CT scan." They found something outside, a tumor outside. Anyway, I end up going in and taking it out. It was it was like three point five on the mitotic scale. Um, in the sixteen hundreds, it would have killed me. But 15 years ago, they fixed it, and I'm, I'm good to go. So mm. my, so the reason I tell that is my daughter got ner- nervous, and she's like, we need to find out your medical history from from who your dad is and what he's, what's going on. So oh, right. just found out that he, he was 85, 86, and just passed away six, six eight months ago, maybe a year ago. Mm. Um, I've seen one picture of him, um, and, and so that's what I know of him. But I got so lucky by being adopted when I was two – by my by my father who is my my dad you know firefighter uh, grew up in early my early years grew up in this in the uh sugar house area and that's kind of where i learned so my mom worked my dad was a firefighter he also ha- had a painting contracting business and so they they were just workers they were working all the time and so after that's where school you got it. yeah no i i think so i probably after school, there was a boys' club that was just right down. I was probably I don't know seven, eight ish. Where are you living now? Right in Sugar House. In Sugar it's House. like, okay. I want to say it's twenty first South and like eleventh East, some somewhere right in there. Um, our favorite thing to do was go to the Levitt's um, dumpster, where they would throw out brand new like lamps and brand new. I don't know why they threw these things away. So we would just get in the dumpster and take them and take them out by the railroad tracks and set up huts and have just a great old time building our own little house. But there was a um, boys and girls club down there, and that's where I first I, my first memory of getting a bat and having someone throw me a ball. And like, I really like this, you know, I, I can I can actually hit the ball. 
And so I think I grew from there. I kind of grew a love of, of baseball and, and, and just kind of went from there. And we ended up going, moving out to Taylorsville, went to Taylorsville High School. I didn't know you were a T-ville guy. Yeah, I would have gone to Kearns. So I was a West Side guy. Yeah. I would have gone to Kearns. Copper but, Hills for the win. Yeah, there we go. Um, when you have, Whenever you say Copper Hills, I think of Braden Taylor, who's the recruit we lost to TCU, who was a Big 12 freshman of the year last year. So I'm really sorry. I don't like to hear Copper Hills. I'm but, really sorry. It's but better I'm, than Bates But I'm happy me. for it. <laughs> So, uh, I would have baseball. Ba- there was a big was rivalry huge. when I was in high school. Yeah. Yeah. So Taylorsville, it just baseball wise, it just hit it right. So I was fortunate enough my sophomore year and it was just by like lack of people. I was playing as a 15 year old. We made the Babe Ruth regionals. So we went to Hawaii for the Babe Ruth regionals. It was like, man, what a lucky draw huge to deal. do that. And when I get home, I get a call from the football coach. And so you got to think it's like August 15th, you know? And school's going to start in two weeks, and he's like, hey, we need a quarterback. I heard you played quarterback. Well, I hadn't played football for, like, three years, you know. Didn't play – I played, like, Gremlins and Bantams or whatever, and then just like, yeah, I'll just play baseball. So I, I started quarterback my sophomore year. wasn't – I was horrible. Started, started quarterback, started um, point guard on the basketball team. And baseball, there was just so many great baseball players that some came from Kearns, some came from, from Cottonwood. But we started nine freshmen, one senior, and like they went on from there. And we didn't ever win a state championship. We we won a Legion state championship, American Legion, which was big back then. Um, but they went on to win ten or twelve state championships at Taylorsville. Um, and Ron Rushton was my coach and just a great mentor for me. Taught me like we had these chalk talks, amazing chalk talks before practice that lasted. In my mind, they lasted like an hour and a half. They were probably 20, 30 minutes. But he would always like talk bunning and, and, and break down bunning and break down hitting. And then he'd always go, well, that's enough That's enough said about that. But then he would keep going and talk a little bit more about it. <laughs> and then Steve Cramblett, who was my um, assistant basketball coach, JV basketball coach, and, and he was the defensive varsity coach. And, and he also was the assistant uh, ba- fo- uh, baseball coach. He took over the program and just took it to a new level. And won all these state one of the one of the best high school coaches in the state of Utah. And what's interesting is he was a basketball guy, but he just studied baseball, and he worked. He he took his pitchers all winter long, and worked with them at the baseball academy. And people go, well, why are there so many good pitchers at Taylorsville? Well, it's because their coach worked with them all winter. I mean, he he actually went in and worked individually with each one of these pitchers, and. So there's no no wonder why they were good. They had some good talent, but so I kind of learned from an early age. Like this was, I was in a very successful um, twelve year old program at Kearns Kearns International, where we we went to um, not Williamsport. We went to San Bernardino for the regionals. We went to Hawaii when we won the regionals as a fifty. So I kind of grew up winning, winning, winning things and learning how to win. And maybe that was another reason that I, I learned to – because if you lose a lot, then you kind of like, eh, I'll try something else. And so maybe I got lucky by having all these coaches who were really invested in teaching us and, and not maybe really even teaching us at, at the, that age, but just investing their time. And that's one thing about my dad is he wasn't a baseball guy, but he, he would always – he always coached, always coached. Um, he, he was a mil- in the military – and I always remember he there was a big green bag that he put all his military bag that we put all the baseball equipment in and go to practice. But he was never one of those guys that tried to to try to interfere or overcoach. And if he and if he knew that there was somebody else that knew more, hey, go ahead, take him. And so I, I've always really appreciated that. And I don't know if I appreciated that when I was growing up, but I think more than anything, it was just the time and and the opportunities to to be able to do those things that you love. And I look at some parents nowadays and how they're like they berate their kids on the field and they get upset. And I'm like, I shake my head going, there's like this is so detrimental to your kid's psyche and what's going to happen in the future. Just just enjoy, you know, just try to enjoy. Not everybody's going to be a superstar. So just enjoy what they have. Talking to Mike Littlewood on uh, Deep Blue. So you graduate from Taylorsville and was it a natural choice to come to BYU? Not really. I was um, I was actually gonna go to to Utah. Um, so so back in the day, I had an opportunity to play basketball at Utah Valley Tech. So it was a junior college or Southern Utah, and I had a, I had an opportunity to go to Southern Utah to play 
uh, baseball and football. Um, I didn't have any, any interest at all. I knew I wanted to play baseball. And so this is how things have changed. I mean, you've got to think how our recruiting is right now. We've got commitments from 2024s, which are sophomores, and 2025s, which are, which are freshmen in high school right now. Which is incredible. It's incredible, yeah. And you have, you to, have, to, you do have to do it. Well, when I was a senior in high school, I had one offer, and that was from Lonnie Keeter, who was a head coach at the University of Utah. I'm like, yeah, that, that's a great place to go. And, and it wasn't really like any Utah guys would go out of state like they do now. It was like you're, you're either going to Utah to BYU to Southern Utah, or, you're not gonna, or maybe a junior college you're not going to play. Well, we are playing um, in the state tournament, and we're playing for the state championship against Bingham. Facing Jay Applegate, who's the head coach at Riverton High School right now, with, had a nasty, he had a nasty curveball. He beat us. Um, I still, I still talk to him. We've recruited a couple of their guys who are coming here to BYU, and um, I still talk to him about his nasty curveball now. Um, but after the game, I'll, I'll never forget going to Coach Rushton and saying, "Hey, does BYU have any interest in me at all?" Because the previous week, I had gone to Dirks Field, which is now Smith's Ballpark, but. That's uh, where the AAA team played, and I saw Corey Snyder and Rick Aguilera and Peter Kendrick and uh, Wally Joyner, all those guys playing, playing, and Steve Eager, you know, all the guys who had this ranked team. And I'm like, man, I would love to go there. 83 is number one in the country. 83, like, 83. So awesome. I, it, it, was like, it was like the best of BYU baseball. And it just, for some reason, it's like, I, and I, it, honestly, it's what I tell my recruits right now. I'm like, there's nothing that I can really tell you that's going to make you come to BYU. I can lay it all on the line, but it's going to be, you're going to wake up one day and go, this is where I want to go. It's a feeling that you're going to get. And hopefully it's, hopefully it's BYU, you know, and I told my son the same thing when Marcus, when he was going through, through his recruiting stuff and that's the way it happened. But that was on a Saturday. And then on that next Monday, coach Pullins calls me. I'll never forget. I was down in my basement. We had a split level house. I'm down in my basement actually had one of those phones that's connected to the wall. So my my mom or dad yells, hey, somebody's BYU's on the phone. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And he, Coach Pullins offered me a scholarship, tuition and books. And I was just looking last week. Tuition when I was at BYU was $700 a semester, just by the way. And I think books were probably, what, 120 So they invested a huge amount of money into, <laughs> into me. So – it was a no-brainer. I think right on the spot, before he could even say, I said yes, and th- and that's where I was going. My scholarship was bigger at Utah, um, it, you know. I and I I love Utah. I respect Utah. There's a there's that natural rivalry, but um, I I respect what they do in, in in their athletic program and everything they do. But it's just for me, um, and I wasn't really like I wasn't. I didn't grow up going to church. My parents didn't go to church. They told me to go to church. Um, but I would rather go to the fire station and throw, th- you know, get, move all the fire trucks out and throw pitch to my dad, you know, on Sundays or go ride my bike. And that's, I didn't start going to church until high school. And so it wasn't because of the church that I came to BYU is because something special when I, when I watched how they did things, uh, it was just a feeling I got. And, it, you know, obviously I'm glad I, I made that choice. Do you remember how many, uh, home runs you had at BYU? No, probably around twenty ish. I don't know. Somebody, you, hit, you hit a ton back. That you hit more than they hit now. Is it the bat? The bats. It was the bats. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it, I was gonna say the skill skill level, but it's the bat because yeah. well, it's skill, like a skill wood. level is number one. <laughs> 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 but it, it's it's definitely the bats. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we we played. It's it's a the trampoline effect. I mean they've they've cut that way down. Mm. We we used like I used a thirty four and a half, thirty two and a half. It was called a long barrel, but the ball would just jump off the bats. It was it was not you'd hit him in the road all the time, and now when guys hit him in the road, you're like, man, that is a which strong. has happened. Oh yeah, it, it it happens. I mean, we have guys that do that right now, but it's it's true strength. And back then, for me, it was like kind of kind of lucky. You'd have to you'd have to um, just hit it on the barrel, and it's going to go a long way. And uh, so the bats have changed. Um, but my sophomore year, I tried to switch hit. And so my numbers were, were down a little bit, and I thought, man, if I want to get drafted, I need to go back. Maybe that was my junior year or sophomore, junior. I can't even remember now. But um, my numbers as a third baseman, as a, as a corner guy, you had to hit home runs. And so You were a third baseman. Uh, yeah, I was a third baseman. I started out as a shortstop. I was a shortstop in high school. Shortstop, back up here um, my, my freshman year. I'd kind of back up third and back up short. 
but then I moved to third and I thought I, I don't have any power and I'm not going to be able to develop it from the le- left side in, in time to get drafted. So I've got to go back to the right side. And I think my senior year I hit maybe 18 or 20 or something like that. But what I'm best known for is um, Ralph Zobel told me is like my walks. I, uh, I was awesome at walking. So <laughs> like number two all time in walks. And I'm like, yeah, baby. I, I, is that a cut or it, I don't I don't really understand that. Is that good or bad? I'm trying to still figure that one out. But anyway, I didn't like to swing the bat apparently. But it, but when I did, I hit a home run. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Okay, so you have a really successful, awesome all conference, uh, you know, career at BYU. You get drafted by the Brewers, and then uh, you, you you try your luck at in Class A, and then kind of what happens at this point? Yeah, I mean, so so we had Tyson, my oldest, who was 18 months, um, and. I, I went to I went to I was drafted in I think the twenty seventh or 29th round um, and I was supposed to go to Helena Montana to play which was kind of like we would come through Salt Lake we would come through Ogden and play and it, like it was felt really comfortable so I go down to extended spring training and that's like the three week period where you get to know the the organization they get to know you and then you end up going to your affiliate your your team and I don't know why but like I was all world during those three weeks they couldn't. They, I made every play. They couldn't get me out. I mean, I'm like, I, I, You're I, walking? I had no. I was walking at a like an incredible <laughs> rate, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but I really like it. This is this is good. And I was playing short, um, making plays that I'd never made at BYU, and I'm like, I, I really don't know what's going on. Got that dad strength. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so they so, I'm I think I'm going to Helena, and they they end up calling me in and saying you're going to Beloit, Wisconsin. And I'm not I, I'm not kidding you. I had to get a map and look where where is Wisconsin? You know, I didn't. There was no f- iPhones where you go. Where's yeah. the, where's that? So I get a map and I go. Oh, it's way over here. I guess we can do that. <laughs> well, at the time, so we get a trailer. Um, my wife went with me. We get a trailer, and we take basically everything we have, which is basically a little little teeny trailer, and we go out there. And I think my salary was eight seventy, maybe eight seventy five a month. We paid 250 for where we lived. We probably paid 150 for insurance for family insurance, which you, if you have a kid, you, you have to have that. If it's just you and your wife, you're like, hey, flip, we'll flip the coin, take our chances, you know. <laughs> um, it, but I think our take home pay was under $200 um, every two weeks. So the professional it baseball was, life. It was rough. In fact, w- there was one time, uh, I think we were in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. It was a day game. We had packed our lunches and we put put our lunches in the car and we were just going to eat them on the way back home. No money, like no money. And we had some change in the in the like the little ashtray thing too. Well, we get done after the game and somebody had broken into our car and they stole the change and they stole some CDs and they stole our lunches. Oh come on! We so we we had we literally could not eat. We we didn't have money to eat and so. Was it a great experience and did it do incredible things for my baseball career? Because somehow you say, yeah, I played professional baseball. Or people say, oh, he – and automatically it raises you to this level that you probably don't even deserve to be at, you know. And it, But it, so I think it really helped me in getting jobs and, and credibility or whatever. But it didn't mean anything really when it comes down to it. And I wouldn't change it for the world because I now I know when I send guys out, I know what I I can tell them first person what it's like. It's mm-hmm. not easy. Yep. And I could tell my son when he was going through that the draft process in 2010, it's not it's not an easy thing. And so I saw some things that you know you wouldn't want your kids to see and experienced some things that were pretty crazy, and and they were super super tough times. But I look back on them as as a great as a great time. And so then I looked at, do I want to try to do this again? I would have to leave my family um, and go do this on my own to, to barely make it, you know. And I, it just didn't feel right. It just didn't feel like – and I and I knew that I would be an average. I felt like I could probably – I wasn't very good that first year. I knew I could do better, but I just felt like it wasn't – I would I would just would have been an average player and just kind of like struggle a little bit. And so I thought, let me just try to go do something else. And so – um, tried the, tried, in fact, I worked at, it's now Costco. It was price savers way back in the day, um, in the buying department. And my job was to track ketchup and mustard and all, all these other grocery items from whatever boat they're on to, and get them to the store. That was my job. It was super, super important. 
<laughs> because if, if you don't have ketchup oh, listen. on the shelves at Costco or toilet paper, as we've seen, you're in big time trouble. So that was my responsibility. And they got bought out and I had a chance to go to Denver to do to and, and have a better job like as an assistant buyer, not just the assistant to the assistant. And or I could they'd give me a year severance. And I thought, man, this is a, a perfect opportunity for me to, to go back to school and get my teaching certificate, because literally every single day I would look out this window and wonder what the coaches are doing. Like, I wonder what Coach Russian's doing today. I wonder what Coach Kramlitz doing today. So I knew it was in my blood that I wanted to coach. I was just kind of like, nah, money, do I do this? And what do I, how do I do it? I don't have my teaching certificate. How do I get into it? And so that was my opportunity. It was a, a, a blessing when that company got bought out. Um, and it wasn't, it, it went another name and then it went to Costco. But um, that was the transition of how I got into, and, and then it was just so fortunate. I went, I had to come back for almost two years to get my, my pedagogy, how to, how to teach classes. Um, you had to do your student teaching, which is another semester. Uh, so it took me a year and a half to do that. And before I was done, Gary Garcia at, at Alta High School, who three years ago, had three years previous, had won a state championship. But the next two years, he kind of gave up. He's like, nah, I'm done. And they won two games or three games total the, the next couple years. He called me and said, hey, I heard you're graduating. Um, I'm leaving Alta. Would you would you want to interview for this job? And I said, absolutely. Like it was a premium job. Alta was like the school that you wanted to be at. Um, and so I ended up getting that job. Stayed there three years. Dixie opened their job, and there was about eighty applicants for there. I didn't think I had a chance, and that's when I went. That's when I jumped over to Dixie. And like I didn't when Dixie offered me the job, I honestly didn't know if I wanted to take it because. That's when I got offered the refereeing thing, and I, I was like, I, I, man, there was a lot of consternation over what, what to do at that point. But I ended up doing it, and it ended up being just great for me. Did you win a national championship at Dixie? Won a national championship. A bunch of junior college lost a national series. championship. So mm-hmm. in, in 2001, we went to the – you know, and it's amazing. Like, it, it gave me those the, – the first 10 years we were junior college. And then in 2006, we transitioned to NCAA Division II. So – I feel so fortunate to have, have coached American Legion baseball, high school baseball, junior college baseball, NCAA Division II baseball, and, and now Division I baseball. So I've, I've seen it all, you know, and um, I, I feel like if you're just, if you've just been at the Division I level, you get spoiled. Like I've, I had someone that I won't name in our program one time, my first couple of years, we pull into a courtyard and, and um, they're like, we're staying here. And I, I wanted to, like, wring their neck, to be honest with you. It's like, are you kidding me? We stayed at Red Roof Inn and Days in, you know, and we stayed four to a room. And so I'm, I'm so thankful for all those experiences that, that I had. I mean, we, we had to buy our own cleats at Dixie. You know, they had to buy their own sleeves. And if they wanted a coat, it was, it was a little bit more. You didn't have to buy a coat, but you could buy a coat. And so um, I'm, I'm grateful. But what it taught me – with winning that national championship is that anything's possible. In 2001, we were playing North Texas State. I think it was North Texas State or North Texas Junior College. And we have a 2-1 lead going into the eighth inning, and we, we end up losing the game by one run for the, na- the national championship game and in Grand Junction. And then had another and, – and you get to a national championship game, and um, I was thinking about this Monday when, when I was down and watching soccer. You just never know if it's ever going to happen for you again. It's, it's just – there's so many things that have to fall in line to get you. To, it's never the best team. You know, it's, it's, it's a really, really good team, but it's also a team that has a, f- a few breaks, gets a couple calls, doesn't have many injuries, and so you just never know. So we lose it in 2001, and, and then we come back in 2004 and we're playing San Jacinto, who's one of these storied programs, and um, Seminole State was in that. There was su- it was such a good tournament. And we end up winning that by by one run and winning the national championship in 2004. But what what it made me think is with every single team that I coach is those that's possible. This team that we have this year, we should win our league. We should make a regional. And I think our goal is to make we've talked about as a team to make a super regional. And once you get there, you never know what what can happen. You just never know. You can get hot and you can make it to the World Series. And that's what like keeps me going every single year is is the potential of what's out there of what can happen in, in a new year because 
because I know just I know from personal experiences that even though you don't think things can happen, they they really can. I know the College World Series is a big deal because Spencer worked in Grand Junction where they would host it, and it was a big deal. Huge. I saw the videos he would do. He actually invited me to go work with him there, and I told him no. Oh, to stay here. <laughs> yeah, I I didn't I didn't want to make nineteen, uh, you know, a year. But uh, you know, Spencer paid his dues, and he's back, and he's he's thriving. It's awesome. Okay, so you, you have so much success at Dixie. You're also doing everything, like you talked about. Like, hey, you're spoiled at D1. Weren't you like the groundskeeper mm-hmm. and the head coach and the – Yeah. Were you doing everything? Did it all. Yeah. So I was responsible for the two blocks that were around the field. and They let me hire an assistant after a few years um, to do – and I had him do the, the outer grounds. So up, there's if you're down there, if you're ever down there, it's a two-block um, area. And I concentrated mainly on the field. But during the season, we had 35 guys, and every guy had their specific job, whether it was um, – we had some – Sunbrook Golf Course was nice enough to, to loan me some uh, reseeding like tubes. And so we would reseed. It was, it was obviously rye grass. It was different grass than we have up here. Um, and so if there was ever a divot, we would clear the divots after practice, fill them in. Um, guys would sweep off the – everybody had their own job, and the hmm. field was absolutely perfect. We took a lot of pride in it. And I, I was the mowing guy, so I got on the mower every single day, would mow it a different way, and – uh, just like you see when you're out golfing, you, when you see someone going down the fairway, that's what I did pretty much every day, and as well as edge and weed and do all that stuff. But I loved it. You know, like, like that's what when I was at Alta High School, that's what I did. And, and I think as a baseball coach, until you get to the level of a, a Division One level, that's what you do, and that's what you're used to. It's and and I think that's what's different. I think that's what makes baseball players more humble than most other athletes. And that's just the truth. I mean, um, in, in different sports, it's like everything is just handed to you and you don't have to, you know, like basketball, there's nothing really to do. You just walk out and play. You might mop, you might have to run the, the, the mob down the court once or twice, but there's so much to do in baseball. And we're just, we're just brought up that way is you do it yourself. If you want it done, you do it yourself. And, and so maybe that's how, maybe that's part of the work ethic thing. And my kids grew up on the baseball field too, they would come and help, and I would have them. They they were out there a lot of times with me, working on the field and kind of learning that work ethic as well. So when the job opens up at BYU, is that an easy decision? Because it feels like you were having a good time at Dixie. You're also refing, or was it like, yes, I want to go back to BYU? So interesting story when when Vance got the job in 2001. I, I don't know 2000, when, I think. 2000 2001. I I inter- I put my name in, interviewed for that job as well. Um, and he got the job. I, that's all I'll say about that. And um, I wasn't sour grapes at all. Um, I, I thought I thought the decision was probably made, um, if that's fair to say, before, which is okay. I mean, he's an ex-big leaguer, great coach, was really good at, at Provo High School. And, and it, he deserved it. But I thought it was and, – and there were some issues after that that um, – that we won't go into, but so when this, so when the next opportunity came around, it wasn't like I was going to jump at it. It's just my dream job. Yeah. I love, I love being here. Um, I having played here and I've got a great passion for BYU, but I didn't apply. Um, honestly, until Brian Santiago called me the day before it closed and said, Hey, you can apply for this job. And I said, yeah, I am. And what, I don't know if I was waiting for that. If I'm like, Hey, I don't need to go there. I'm, I'll probably make more money doing what I'm doing, staying right here, being comfortable, and having no no pressure whatsoever of ever getting fired from this job. Where if I go up there, I, I, I'm going to have to win, which is what I plan on doing is what I want to do, and I'm totally good with that because I'm the first one that would say if I have year after year of no success and I can see it going nowhere, I'm, I'm the first one that's going to bail and go, hey, somebody else has got to give it a shot. I, I can't do it. And so that didn't scare me, but – to some to some point, I wanted them to recognize or want me. Uh, you know, you if, needed if that, a nudge. Yeah, I probably needed a little bit of a nudge. And and if he didn't call, what have I what have I applied? Probably at the last minute, um, because I wa- I wanted to be here. Um, and so it's worked out. But it wasn't an, like it wasn't a a no brainer. Hmm. It wasn't just a no brainer. Like oh yeah, I'm in and I'm I'm going to go do this. 
it took some thought and and that's kind of the same time we were talking about like should we just ref and not do anything else and so there was a lot of thought a lot of thought that went into it it's been nine or ten years now uh, going on ten this that's year. a long yeah that's yeah. a long time what where have you found success and what is uh what are some of the challenges you're still encountering well I mean the successes are are the relationships and I think if you ask m- most of our players you would think that I, I would think the answer, like, what kind of a coach is he? Like, he, they would probably say he's a tough coach. You know, he expects he expects the most out of us, and there's not much on the field that I miss. And if and if you're if you're making mental errors, I'm going to let you know about it. You know, and and so, but I would hope that they would also say that I've got their best interests at heart. And uh, you know, I I think it's all about the relationships, and sometimes they don't get that when they're playing. Um, I just got a call yesterday from a guy I coached in. Um, Gosh, I don't or in the '90s and said, "Hey, I'm coaching at a high school. Can you come and, and speak in January to, to my uh, my fundraising thing?" And and so those are the things that uh, I'm I'm on a thread with the 2004 um, national championship team. And so every three weeks, like these 22 guys, Brandon Kinsler's on it, who's in the big leagues, you know, and and there's there's that camaraderie that we have, and and that develops and it stays and. Those guys that I coached 25 years ago are like, "Hey, coach, how you doing?" And th- that's what makes it important to me. So, that's what I love about this thing. And I think, but on the daily, you're you're caught up in the in the W. You're always chasing the W, no matter what it is. Every thought that goes in your mind, every decision you make, is about getting a win. And um, so, if I look back, you know, 20 years down the road, and I look back and go, "Man, I wish I wouldn't have done that." I don't know that I could say that because that's what this is all about. If I don't get W's, I don't have a job. And if I don't and if we don't get wins, then this isn't a success, successful program no matter how everybody's doing. So so that's that's probably one of the struggles is just chasing that win and always trying to do your best and we made the regional in 2016 and now it's like now we got to step it up and do something different. Um, the challenges I think some of those challenges might go away being a mid major. I mean there's just certain certain restrictions um, unwritten restrictions on the recruiting process, just being a, um, a mid, what's considered a mid-major, even though we felt like we were P5 equivalent, the, the student athletes that we're trying to recruit looked at, looked at us as a non-P5. And so those recruiting doors are going to open. Um, but the challenge is now when it comes down to it, we're battling against other Big 12 schools and not Pacific or not Santa Clara or Pepperdine. We're battling against TCU and Texas Tech and, and Oklahoma and Oregon State, those are the teams. Where, so so it's going to be fun. Um, it's going to be challenging. But man, I'm sh- I'm so looking forward to that new era. Um, but we got to get stuff done in the next two years instead of like looking forward. I just want to make a statement this year and next year in the West Coast Conference, and then put a good team on on the field in our first year in the Big Twelve. It's exciting time, and uh, during your tenure, you've you got back BYU back to a regional, which is super exciting. Uh, that was part of perhaps the greatest WCC tournament oh. or conference tournament BYU's ever played in losing. Uh, you know, the first game in a double elimination tournament, and then having to win every game since then. From then, it was incredible beating Gonzaga twice. You put in the artificial turf field, which has been a game changer. I know there's been conversation. I don't know where we stand on a video board uh, with the field, so. The program's going in a great direction right now. It feels like yeah. The video board they actually um, and this is this is a, a a hot button topic at BYU, but they actually re- removed a tree. We had we had to remove one tree. It was removed, so that hopefully tells me that the scoreboard is going to replace that. <laughs> the scoreboard was supposed to be put in a couple well a month, about a month ago, and they ran into some issues with a certain company. They rebid it. Um, they're going to start January uh, with installation, and it should be up by the first of the year, but. It's gonna be it's gonna be like um, almost sixty feet by uh, thirty feet high, and it's gonna be like looking at your iPhone, and it's gonna be super interactive with the fans. Um, we'll have we may not put spin rates up there, but exit velos, and it, we'll put a lot of information up there and, and and videos. It's gonna be it's gonna be really awesome. Will we still have that'll be in right field? It's gonna be in right center field. Yeah, right center. <clears throat> And not we'll keep the one in left. We'll keep right. the one in left. Just with the nostalgia. Score, we'll keep the score. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and obviously we can put the score on the on the big video board, and and we may kind of do that once in a while. But we're going to use that mainly as just um, player information, player video, um, 
just wh- whatever whatever we can come up with. It's just going to be fun and exciting for fan interaction, and then keep this keep that score because I I like the scoreboard out in left field. I think that's uh, just kind of a cool old old school thing. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. Is there anything else we haven't talked about that people need to know about Mike Little one? Uh, I, I I don't really like talking about myself, so that's probably an, an hour longer than I <laughs> than I like. But I just I just love what I'm doing. I mean, I think if I wasn't here doing this, I'd I'd go try to find like a little league team or a high school team that I could help coach. And um, th- I feel like this is this is what I was born to do, you know. Um, and and I love every minute of it. I think you're the right guy for the right team at the right time, which is exciting. And we uh, appreciate interacting with you during the games, which is super fun. We look forward to the season. Should be a fun year. Yeah, we're working hard. Okay, it's coming up quick. Okay, that'll do it for us. Listen to previous episodes on the BYU Radio app or we're a podcast or fan. For Mike Littlewood and producer Tanner Graff, I'm Jerem Jordan. You've just listened to Deep Blue on BYU Radio.